Good afternoon, and welcome to the June 22nd GMC membership meeting. I'm David Lubar, Chair of the GMC and President and CEO of Lubar & Co. Before we begin, I want to remind you that your video and microphone are on for this meeting, as we will use them when we move into the breakout rooms later on. Currently, everyone is muted, and we ask that you stay muted until the breakout room portion. For today's highlight, we have Jeff Yubuki, Chairman and CEO of Pfizer. But before we move into an interview with Jeff, I'd like to ask Julia Taylor to provide updates on the GMC initiatives. Julia? Great. Thank you, David. Uh, after we hear from Jeff, we're gonna continue the conversations that we had on June 8th, discussing systemic racism in America and in Milwaukee. For the past five years, the GMC has intentionally focused on the issues of inequities in communities of color through our initiatives. We know that for communities of color to prosper and build generational wealth, they have to have access to more capital flow, they need more support for entrepreneurial growth, and they have to have the ability to have safe housing and strong anti-displacement policies and strategies for homeowners and renters who are the neighborhood anchors and in some cases are being forced out of their long-term homes due to downtown market value increases and property tax increases. So I want to talk some about what we have been doing. Uh, Scale, Mil Scale Up Milwaukee has created two additional programs to specific, specifically address the economic and entrepreneurial barriers that business owners of color have historically faced. SPARK is an accelerator program designed specifically for minority and women-owned businesses under $1 million and Riding Tide, a cohort-based uh, program that works with business owners of color to create generational wealth. Due to COVID, these companies, growing companies are struggling and we don't wanna lose the companies or the jobs. But as you can see with SPARK, we've had 66 companies that have gone through the program the last two years. Projected revenue growth before COVID was 49%. 67% uh, of them are owned by entrepreneurs of color. And as you can see, the revenue is 17 million. And there was significant employee growth uh, during the two years of the program. Rising Tide launched in 2018 as a cohort that's within our traditional growth accelerator. Uh, there are nine companies in total that have gone through this, six African-American owned, three Hispanic owned, and four women owned. Uh, 37.3 million in 2019 in additional projected revenue. So as we've worked on that, uh, we've also been working on Milwaukee United. In Milwaukee United, uh, we're a partner in Milwaukee United with Greater Milwaukee Foundation, the City, the Urban League, and List Milwaukee and we address the issues of inequities in the neighborhoods surrounding uh, downtown Milwaukee that have been brought on by lack of capital flow. Our current focus is on preventing anti-displacement, housing, jobs, and commercial corridor development within these communities of color. This past year, a strong Milwaukee United Collaborative launched Brew City Match, which is a public and private partnership to mitigate displacement, develop vacant storefronts and key commercial corridors, and encourage entrepreneurship. And as you can see, it's been a very robust collaboration. LISC Milwaukee has been uh, the group that's been managing this and has also received significant funding from both uh, J.P. Morgan Chase's National Foundation and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. So if we take a look at the impact of Brew City Match, there's been almost uh, 2 million in capital deployed in grants and loans, uh, 1 million in public capital leverage, uh, four, th four million in private capital that's been leveraged. Over 90 businesses have been assisted. These are small businesses. 92% of them are ran by entrepreneurs of color. And we have 80% um, are women owned. And we have 45% commercial properties uh, that have been redeveloped as a result of Bruce City Match. And 1 million square feet of uh, commercial property was redeveloped. Bruce City Match, besides this, has also received uh, both COVID relief funding and emergency grant dollars that they've been able to deploy out to, uh, to the 90 businesses. So like Spark and Rising Tide, the focus is on the survival of these young businesses. And we wanna thank the funding partners that have continued to provide the emergency grants and loans, but quite frankly, 
we will need more help to continue to go forward. Uh, this past year, we launched a 400,000 anti-displacement fund through Milwaukee United that was created in the fourth quarter of 2019 that helped 88 homeowners remain in their homes in the areas surrounding the north and south parts of the significant downtown development. Uh, the commons, uh, I think many people, we really appreciated the membership stepping up to help us launch a virtual internship summer program and it reflects the focus on equity. 50% of uh, students are students of color, 52% are female, and 30% of these interns are the first in their families to attend college. We have uh, 100 interns and uh, uh, the vast majority of them are also receiving stipends this summer that we're hearing from many uh, college students, basically their only income they're earning this summer. So to create long lasting systems change, we have to continue to work together. And these partnerships are critical to having major impact. But we also need your input and commitment as we address the reality of systemic racism and the challenges it presents. We're going to ask you to share what you think the GMC's role should be going forward. Today's breakout rooms will focus on how we can create change. How do we have even more impact with policy change, our programs, and support our community partners. After we receive your feedback, the GMC is bringing together a member community and partner work group and a board committee to decide on our next steps to address systemic change. We thank you for speaking candidly and for continuing to want to learn and be an active part of the solution. David, back over to you. Thank you, Julia. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jeff Yabuki, Chairman and CEO of Fiserv. With more than 30 years of experience in the financial services industry, Jeff joined Fiserv and its board of directors in 2005. Under, under his leadership, the company has transformed from a traditional holding company model into an integrated operating company with 44,000 associates and 15.8 billion in annualized pro forma revenue. Jeff has led the company's growth through an organic growth strategy as well as with major strategic acquisitions. In 2020, Fiserv was recognized among Fortune's world's most admired companies for a seventh consecutive year. Prior to joining Fiserv, Jeff was Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at H&R Block for more than six years. He also had held a progression of leadership positions at American Express, culminating with President and CEO of American Express Tax and Business Services. Jeff is currently a member of the Board of Directors of Royal Bank of Canada and Exonia Bank Shares. He is also a trustee of the Milwaukee Art Museum. So Jeff is retiring as CEO of Fiserv on June 30th and will continue as chairman of the board through the calendar year. He has had great impact at Fiserv and our community. So this is a chance to get to know Jeff better and to understand better what he has accomplished. So uh, I and we will be interviewing Jeff for the next 30 minutes. And if you have questions, please submit them via your chat box. Welcome, Jeff. We appreciate you spending time with us. And I'd like to uh, pose a few questions that I have prepared for you. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. I, uh, uh, I, um, when, when people talk about all the things that you've done, it just reminds me how old I am. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Well, we don't know how old you are. <laughs> old. Okay. So um, the first question, you were born and raised in California and attended college at California State University, Los Angeles. Can you tell us more about those early years, what you were like as a youngster? And were there notable personal experiences that stand out? Sure, thanks, uh, David. Uh, I, um, I, I, because you were so kind as to share that with me in advance, I, I thought I had a chance to think about that. 
And I suspect I could spend the majority of the time with the group talking about, quote, the notable experiences. Uh, but I, I, I would say that uh, most impactful is, you know, I grew up, my, uh, my father is Japanese, uh, my mother is Jewish, my father was in internment during World War II, neither of them finished high school, uh, and uh, I was, uh, you know, the first kid to go to college, you know, kind of one of those, uh, those types of stories. And, and, you know, growing up in an environment where, you know, you're struggling and you're pushing and you're clawing, uh, you, you know, for me, I was able to watch my parents and how hard they worked. And, uh, and I grabbed onto that, but probably the most important thing that I would say is what I learned from that is, you know, how you treat people makes all the difference. And, you know, when you, when you are uh, trying to figure out how to navigate and you're trying to get help, whether it be mentorship, uh, one of the things that I did early in my career is I had aspirations to be a professional bowler. Uh, and so go, coming to Milwaukee was fantastic because, of course, the, you know, Wisconsin, because of, of course, the, the Bowling Hall of Fame. But, but I worked in bowling alleys, and it turned out that uh, I ended up having a fantastic mentor um, who helped me first by firing me uh, and then by rehiring me, uh, but teaching me uh, what it what it's like to make mistakes, pay for your mistakes, and and come back, and 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 so I would say it's dotted by some teachers, uh, by some people I worked with, uh, in terms of people caring enough to help. And so, you know, as we're going through such an interesting time right now as a a nation and a world. Right, the ability to give back through mentorship, the ability to really understand what it's like to 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 have have clawed and fought and had to live in different circumstances. You know, there were times when my family was on uh, on government aid programs. Right, I mean, those kinds of things all contribute to to who you are. So it's not that there's a specific experience or two that I would call out, uh, maybe except for one, and that is I never actually had any aspiration to go to college. You know, when you're, uh, probably people here can relate, your parents, you know, the, the life of a parent is you want your children to do better than you. And so for my parents, neither of whom I mentioned graduated high school, uh, my father finished the eighth grade, my mother finished the 10th grade, they just wanted me to graduate high school. And so going to college was never in the uh, in kind of the domain. Um, and for reasons that I won't bore the group with today, uh, when I was in my mid 20s, I decided I would go to college. And I had I had a, didn't do very well in high school and didn't uh, I don't like to tell my children that they don't appreciate the the double standard. But didn't do well in high school. Didn't. Uh, uh, had to go to community college. I never took entrance exams and any of that and really, you know, kind of fought up a different way. Uh, and, and I would say that, you know, life is, a, life is just a series of those, of those uh, forks in the road. And sometimes you take the right one, sometimes you take the wrong one. But there's always a chance to get back on that right track. And for me, I was fortunate enough to have people who helped me get there. Well, thank you, Jeff. That's... Uh... That's very interesting to understand those early years. So uh, after you did go to college and graduate, uh, your career, uh, as I understand it, advanced very rapidly. And you're, you're clearly smart, and you just talked about how hardworking you are. Did you, when you went to American Express and then H&R Block, was it the hard work and your intelligence, or did you have mentors, or were there specific experiences or challenges that you were able to overcome that helped enable you to advance so rapidly in both of those companies? Yeah, it's a great, it's a, a great question. Um, I, I would say, you know, given my background, I didn't really understand how to navigate sophisticated political environments. 
you know, it's, you know, my, my dad worked for himself. He always had his own gardening business and, you know, he specifically didn't want employees. He wanted to do his own thing. So I had no basis for understanding that, uh, except for what I learned in, in my life. I, I became a CPA first, was in public accounting and then went into American Express. So I started to pick those things up. The, the, the thing that, that I would say the, the things that really mattered is, is you, I watched, I watched everything from how people eat and handle themselves at business meals to how people handle themselves in meetings. Um, and when you go into a larger corporate environment, for those of you who are in those environments, you know, right, that they have their own, their own rules and norms and politics and they have their own culture and you have to figure that out. And one of the things that I learned early, and I always give this advice, um, as you referenced, I, I, and I said, I work hard. I never thought I was going to, I was the smartest person, but I, I knew that it was, I needed to focus on those things that I could control. And two things that I knew I could control is I could make sure that no one ever outworked me. So I was always going to do whatever I needed to do work-wise. I never wanted it to be a matter of effort. I always want to use an athletic metaphor. I always wanted to leave everything on the field. I never, ever wanted to miss that opportunity. And what I learned is that if you make your boss look good and then they can get promoted, they want to drag along the people who make them look good. And so, you know, you often get into these environments where people want to take credit. I was always very comfortable giving credit to other people, believing that that would somehow turn into good things for me. And, and, and I think that strategy worked over time. But that, you know, work, work hard, do the work, make your boss look good. And anything that someone gives you that you have no idea what to do, take it because you can almost always turn it into something. So little things like that. Sounds like very apropos advice. In 2005, you were recruited to Fiserv as the CEO. And Fiserv was a company built on acquisitions, very, um, a very well-regarded founder, George Dalton who started in banking at the Midland Bank uh, here in Milwaukee. What was the company like when you took over? And because under your direction, Fiserv significantly increased its revenues, increased its earnings, and it's become the most valuable Wisconsin company as measured by market value of your equity. So when you came here, how did you de develop your vision, your strategic plan? Uh, the Marine Midland Bank. There's some Lubar connection in that Marine Midland Bank, isn't there? We're talking about you right now. Okay. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> look, I, I, it was an incredible privilege to uh, have an opportunity to come run Fiserv. I mean, when I... When I started uh, back in 05, as you noted, uh, the company had already achieved kind of a 20,000% return. It was one of the most successful companies ever. Uh, George, uh, uh, Les, Muma, uh, Don Dillon, a variety of folks, they put it together, Ken Jensen, and put it together uh, as a, uh, a, basically as a holding company, as a miniature Berkshire Hathaway focused on banking and banking technologies, but a very, uh, a very, uh, a very uh, siloed, separate uh, basis. When I started, the company had 77 separate uh, companies, uh, 77 separate presidents, 77 separate vice presidents and CFOs and everything else. We had 72 email systems, 55 benefit plans, I mean, we really were operating as, as a, a hold co. Uh, and even though many of our clients at that time, 99% of our clients were financial institutions, the people in the company would rather work with their competitors and bring them in as opposed to work with their peers and colleagues. And so, I, I, you know, as most times in my career, you didn't have to be that smart. You just had to go out and talk to clients. And what clients wanted was one place that they could get a lot of stuff. 
And so we, we went in and, and did a series of analyses on what could we do if we decided to be kind of more of a one-stop shop. And we learned that virtually no one is able to create success on a strategy based on cross-selling. Uh, and maybe foolishly, or some might say stupidly, we decided to see if we could be the first people to really make that happen. And so um, we decided that we would have become an operating company, not a holding company, uh, which is really easy to say and super hard to do because the cultures are very different. David, as you know, and others know, if all of a sudden you decide to put all of your businesses together, you'd have all kinds of interesting interpersonal dynamics and everything else that go on. So we decided to take that on, but we had the beauty of this incredibly resilient model um, uh, and uh, one that generates significant profitability. Uh, they were great assets that had been built by the founders of the company. Uh, but again, coming in from the outside, not from the industry, um, we had to create a vision, and we created a vision of being this different company. Uh, we created a vision that would differentiate on, on delivering all of the services that clients needed. Um, and, you know, what most people don't understand is we actually divested more than half of the company. We sold off. The company was about $4 billion of revenue when I started. We sold off $2 billion of that revenue, and we really kind of started over but we started to do some important acquisitions that were based on where we thought the world was going. We bought check free. So that for those of you who pay your bills online, you're probably using our technology and a variety of other companies that allowed us to reshape and, and be positioned. But the other thing is, is, is what we adopted a philosophy that the money that the company created wasn't our money. It was our shareholders money. And we decided we would give it back. And so over the, the first 14 years of my tenure, we bought back over 50% of the outstanding shares of the company. And so, you know, we've also had the privilege of delivering um, 36 years in a row uh, of double digit uh, adjusted earnings per share growth, which we're the only company in the United States who can make that claim. So, you know, we, when you put all those pieces together and you made it compelling for the people in the company based on delivering value for clients, it turned into a pretty, a pretty good solid vision. You know, the company had been flat for five years when, uh, when I got here uh, through the end of 19, uh, we had delivered 970 969% shareholder return, beat the S&P all of uh, all the years, uh, all those 14 years. And now the company has a cumulative return above 41,000%. So, you know, I feel like uh, in my role, I was able to, 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 as, as the gatekeeper, the company set it up for the next generation of the company, which is, which is what we do as CEOs, right? We prepare the company for the next generation. Well, those numbers are astounding. So congratulations on achieving that meteoric uh, type of return. So just to uh, um, elaborate a little bit more, you sold half the company and is that because the products didn't fit with the vision of where you wanted to go? Or was it to try to actually integrate 77 different businesses and different systems and email systems that that, that task would just kind of mire you down and there was just no way operationally that you could accomplish that? Yeah, uh, another uh, another uh, good question. It was really the former. Uh, we we created a strategic construct, and and basically assessed every one of the seventy seven businesses uh, for fit and for potential to deliver value for clients. And and frankly, we just did it very quantitatively and unemotionally. And there were just a group of businesses that didn't make the cut, and so. In order, you know, in order to send a message to an organization that you're serious, you have to be willing to take those kinds of steps. And the, the hardest and most difficult part of this was convincing that at the time, the 20,000 people 
of Pfizer that the strategy that had worked very well, right? I said of more than a 20,000% return worked very well that w there could be something better. There could be a, a more beautiful vision ahead, a more vibrant rainbow. And, and that, that part of the right that we got, part of the, the credibility that we earned is by doing what we said we would do. We did all the hard integration. We, we eliminated all those systems. We, we did all of that. We brought people together. We homogenized our talent management systems. We didn't have any of those kinds of systems because we were a holding company. They all sat in the different businesses. But it was really to the former of, you know, the most difficult, one of the most difficult things for a CEO is admitting that someone else can do something better than you can. You know, as CEOs, we all think we can do everything well. I know you understand that feeling, right, David? <laughs> No comment. No comment. Right. <laughs> but but we try. The, we all try. Yeah, of we course. We try to do the but, right thing and but, we try to do our best. You know, we, for example, we sold our health, our health care management processing capability to United Healthcare because we were never going to beat United Healthcare. Right? You just we don't we couldn't invest in that level. And 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 the idea that you can create value by making your company smaller is hard. It's sometimes hard for you to understand both rationally, but also from an ego perspective. Uh, and and I, you know, at least for me, given how lucky I felt to be here, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that I was staying kind of very, very clearly focused on the five pillars of strategy that we that we uh, delineated and articulated, uh, and and whether that was divesting or acquiring. Uh, investing, stopping, all of those kinds of things. We had a construct that everyone understood, and I think that actually helped us a lot. So after you were completed with uh, the divestitures and the integration, you've continued to make major acquisitions. Can you talk about, you know, how, what's the, what's the strategy underlying those acquisitions? Sure, absolutely. And, and I, would, I would also say, you know, David, you said once you were done with the divestitures, we're, you know, one of the things, strategy doesn't stop. Like, so we, we've continued to do these assessments every couple of years because as the world changes, you find that you need to add some businesses and you may need to exit them. We did our most recent divestiture at the beginning of 2020. So, we will, we, we will, and all of us should continue to take good looks at, are we doing things because we always have done them? Or are we doing things because they are consistent with where the world is going? Right now, we're doing another very deep dive given all of the things that are going on in the world today. All of us need to retest our strategies. Are we investing in the right places? Are there things that someone else could do better than we? Are there things that we should be doing because we're, we have more permission than others? So I would just make that point. I think that's a critical point um, in terms of they sh it should always be continuous and we should never be done with strategy. We should stay disciplined but never be done uh, with evolving that. To, to your point, David, I suspect you know, to the uh, broader question of first data and, and, and why. In, in 2007, we bought an, uh, the company I referenced a minute ago called Check Free. And we did that because we believed that the electronic movement of money was going to be the most important thing. And over the years, for FinTech, and over the years, we've continued to add our capabilities. About three years, maybe almost four years ago now, we realized that we had a lot of the assets, the businesses that are necessary to facilitate a payment. So a credit card payment, a debit card payment, a wire transfer, an account to account transfer, now Zelle, whatever it, is, whatever it may be. But we didn't have all of the, the ecosystem. A lot of the ecosystem is around merchant. I can't see everyone, but I suspect most of us spent some money over the weekend. Maybe we, we, we bought some food or we went grocery shopping or bought a book or bought something on Amazon, whatever it is. The point of sale, whether it be a digital point of sale or a physical point of sale, that was missing uh, from our, uh, our set of solutions for the world. 
and and buying First Data, which was the largest merchant is the largest merchant acquirer in the world, gave us the scale that we thought we would need for the next decade of our strategy. It was very intentionally, very focused, and we did. We literally evaluated every player over the last four years and decided that was the right company for us to acquire because they had those those point of sale merchant acceptance capabilities, but also had other payment initiation assets, credit card, debit card, other things that we thought would make Fiserv much stronger. We're now in a position where we're the number one card issuing business in the world, the number one merchant acquirer in the world, the number one ACH provider in the United States, the number one bill pay provider in the United States. And so uh, number one core processor in the United States. So we have all of that scale. Now we have to do cool and interesting things to drive real value for clients. All right, so first data is truly a transformational acquisition. So what, what, what does that mean for the future prospects of Fiserv over the next three to five years? Is that what's going to be driving Fiserv is the integration and the products that, that first data has brought you? So I, I would say uh, simplistically, yes, we wouldn't have done it. We wouldn't have done it otherwise. You know, when it's interesting, and I've gotten a lot of questions on this since in May we announced that I was uh, going to leave Pfizer. You know, it's it's probably important, especially in this community, which I I have come to love so much. And I when I came here in 2005, during the interview process, I told the board of directors that I did not expect to be here more than five to seven years and ten at the very outside, and that was for one reason and one reason only. Not because I wouldn't love the company, because I do, but because I believe that organizations benefit from change. And when you're the CEO, you are the organization. And, and for the last few years, we've been looking and being, paying a lot of attention to succession and what would we do. And we happen to, in acquiring First Data, have an incredibly experienced uh, CEO there who will now take over take over following the strategic platform that we've laid out for Fiserv, putting his own fingerprints, his own DNA on it to, to make us even better. But it was so hard to do because I think, I think we did a, a reasonable job capitalizing on the opportunity that existed in 2005, but that pales in comparison to what lies ahead. There is so much more opportunity, whether it be around the convergence of of payments and how money will move, whether it be the 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 the, digit, the digitization of financial services, and most importantly, the the utilization of the data. I fundamentally believe that the data that resides, that the data that all of us create in our financial lives is the most robust and most interesting data that exists. And Fiserv is in the privileged position of having access to a lot of that data. So there's a lot of opportunity ahead. Uh, and I'm incredibly bullish on where the company is going to be three, five, seven, ten 10 years from now. So Jeff, that's great to hear. I'd like to kind of circle back to um, when you were talking about growing up uh, as a Japanese American in California. Uh, and you didn't, uh, specifically address whether you experienced racism and injustice as a youngster, but um, do you have, do you have uh, advice for, I mean, after, after this, after we're done talking, we're going to break into these chat groups and given what's happening in America, do you have advice for Asian Americans or Hispanics or black Americans on um, you know, overcoming racism and injustice? And, so, and it's a two part question. That's the first part. And the second part is, what advice do you have for white Americans, for the majority, and for our local governmental officials and business leaders? Yeah, that's a, uh, I think it's a, a very thought provoking topic and, and something that is, uh, critically important for all of us right now. You know, as um, I, I would say that the kind of 
injustice that I was subject to pales in comparison to the kinds of things that that we see publicized on a day to day basis. Uh, I did, I did, you know, my father having been in internment during World War II, um, as a relatively young, uh, young, you know, from the ages of nine to 12. Uh, and my dad was born here in the US, uh, put in internment, and then went back to Japan. His family migrated back to Japan. And it was quite interesting in talking to him, he talks about feeling a loss of, of you know, his country. He, my father views himself more as an American than he does uh, as being Japanese, primarily because even though he was treated poorly, arguably, by being put in internment, when he went back to Japan, um, he was treated as an American. And he had incredible stories about how abusive, uh, in his words, the Japanese were to Americans because of what had happened during World War II. Um, uh, so much so that he actually came back to the United States by himself at the age of 16. Uh, and he talked and he talked a hell of a lot about uh, about the things that he was subject to, especially in the South, uh, where the Japanese were not very popular. Uh, and then ironically fought in Korea and did all the things that uh, that uh, you're supposed to do or you would be more normal at that time. So uh, I, I would say that the advice that I would have is more around what do we do now? Uh, and we're, we're all spending a lot of time on on uh, dealing with this issue that is so unbelievably overdue, right? And that is how do we create, how do we create a playing field that's level for everyone? And, and it, I think it, you know, I've heard people talk about, uh, make lots of excuses for the other, for the behaviors that, that we've seen historically, and it really doesn't matter. But I think the hardest thing for all of us is we have to understand the level of bias, the level of unconscious bias that each of us have. And until we as leaders, no matter what your racial predisposition is, no matter what your ethnic background is, no matter what any of your orientations or preferences are, we all hold those kinds of biases. And until we come to grips with the, each of those, we're going to have a hard time. This is not about putting a Band-Aid on. This is how do we systemically make the world a better place? Because diversity is about making the world a better place. Inclusion is about making the world a better place. It's about, it's about having the best thought that you can have, which goes across all these different uh, horizons. But one of the things that I find so interesting is, you know, facial recognition software. You've seen that that some uh, some companies have stopped using it because of the biases that are created in race, even in facial recognition software. I don't think any software engineer intentionally built facial recognition software and embedded prejudicial bias. It's just who we who we, unfortunately, the experiences that we have and, and where we sit today. And so the importance of coming to grip and to listening and to talking, to doing the training, to doing the work, to being sensitive to what it's like to, for others to have to fight in their life. It doesn't matter what any of us have gone through. It just matters what people are going through now. Yes, you may be more empathetic, but how do we how do we move forward? And how do we move forward remembering that until you understand where everyone sits? Because you've got people, I've got lots of, uh, a, a number of friends and family who have police in their family. And how do they feel? Right? And it's not that we should make any excuses, absolutely not, but we should understand that we all come from different places. We have to figure out how to reconcile that and bring it together, have the conversations, but we have to take real action. We, it, we can't just talk about it. My big fear is that we're just going to talk about it. And I, I pray that we as leaders have the tenacity to take the steps that are necessary 
to drive the change systemically. This is not a one year, three year, five, this is five year change. This is a generational change. We better be talking about this in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, because it's gonna take a long time to really get it so that we are all in the place where we wanna be. And that's my biggest fear right now, which isn't exactly what you asked me, but we all have to do that work. We do all have to do that work. And it does begin with talking and then it leads to action. And one of the things we wanna talk about is what actions come from us as individuals, what actions come from us as companies, representing companies, what actions come from our government. And, um, but you're right, we need to be talking about this today, tomorrow, and for generations to come. And acting, and acting, right? Those actions, and holding ourselves accountable to taking action. Action. So, um, we're running out of time, I'm being told right now via the chat. So, uh, uh oh. So I do know that you're an avid basketball fan and film fan. So are we gonna be seeing you at the Bucks playoffs and future games at the Five Serve Forum? We love that name, by the way. Me too. And are we, and are we gonna see you at Milwaukee Film Festival? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, although I don't know when that's going to happen because I think, I think the NBA playoffs are going to be played at Disney World this year, uh, which, which is kind of a bummer for Pfizer Forum uh, and the community, whether it be Pfizer Forum basketball or the DNC and, or any of that. It's, uh, uh, I, but I look forward to getting back out there and, and, and getting back to some level of normalcy in our lives. Uh, although I do, I do, I do think Zoom has made a nice positive impact. Uh, I'm not sure how many movies are going to be at the Milwaukee Film Festival in the future because nothing's being made, but hopefully they'll be back soon. Okay, and one final question. I've been, uh, uh oh. One of the members has asked for an update on the status of your new headquarters. Oh, I'm I'm <laughs> stunned. I'm stunned. Uh, you know, it's a it's a great question. We uh, we have every belief that we will stay in Milwaukee, uh, and we were deeply uh, ensconced into looking at where would we where would we end up locationally. You know, I think I think a bigger issue than our our headquarters is what are what is commercial real estate? What is it going to look like? What are workplaces going to look like? How are they going to be configured? Um, in the month of May, 63% of Americans worked at home, uh, some or all of the month, and something like 40% of Americans want to continue to work at home, some or part of the time. And that's going to have very significant impacts on how you build out space, how what the role of offices and meeting space. Uh, and I think a lot of things are just up in the air until we have a vaccine or another way where people can be back in their, in the groove of their life and feel safe about it. I mean, I, look, Maslow's hierarchy says if you can't feel safe and comfortable, it makes it awfully hard to do the kinds of things that you want to do. So as much as people want to talk about headquarters, I think we all need to be thinking about how will workplaces look over the next few years. Very insightful. So Jeff, thank you for your sharing all your thoughts and your comments and your background. Uh, on behalf of the entire GMC membership, I thank you and look forward to seeing you further in the community. Thank you and thanks everyone, I really appreciate it. Uh, Milwaukee has been great to me. Uh, uh, we, we love it here and uh, we hope to see you out soon uh, without masks and, uh, and those kinds of things. Unless the masks are required. Unless the masks are required. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being more positive. I'm looking for a vaccine. I'm looking for right. vaccine. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. So, now I'd like to move to uh, the next section of our program. And um, I'm turning this over to Greg Wesley, from uh, Senior VP from the Medical College of Wisconsin, who will um, lead us in a discussion with a uh, reaction panel of fellow GMC members 
that is comprised of uh, Melissa Allen, president of uh, Moyers Development Group, Keith Stanley, executive director of the Near West uh, Group, Maggie Doss, community ma manager for the Commons, which is part of the GMC, uh, Isioma Wabuzor, who is vice president and associate general counsel of legal affairs at Robert W. Baird, and Ashley Lee, executive director of Public Allies. So Greg, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, David. Um, glad to be here uh, with support from the Medical College of Wisconsin and uh, our leadership uh, led by John Raymond, president and CEO of uh, MCW. Uh, as Julio mentioned, the GMC has been working to address issues of systematic racism through programs like Scale Up, Milwaukee, The Commons, and MKE United. Um, as one of the co-chairs for MKE United, I can share that the work we're doing is meaningful, impactful, uh, but obviously we all know that uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, one particular program out of MKE United that I'm particularly uh, proud of from an action-oriented standpoint is the Anti-Displacement Fund. Um, an issue was identified after talking to residents, um, saying that they were a longtime um, city um, uh, residents, but uh, were experiencing uh, unprecedented uh, value increases in their in their property values that they couldn't sustain. And um, what MK United wanted to do was to respond to that, and we we stood that up pretty quickly. So uh, that's an action item uh, demonstrating that when communities come together, uh, you can do something well. Um, you know, I, I'm really hopeful that as we have this 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 reaction panel and we're having these discussions, um, when we start talking about action, uh, that action is 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 long term uh, and not short term. Uh, you know, there's obviously measures we, we got to measure what we do, but it has to be a long term investment if we're really going to make any kind of uh, impact. Uh, so uh, to the panelists, I'm going to. Uh, leave it open and I just would ask each one of you to jump in when you feel comfortable. Um, but my first question would be, you know, what's different uh, this time about the protesting? Protesting has had a significant impact on our, on the fabric of our society, but, but why don't we talk about how you view this type of protesting to be different? I can speak oh. first. <laughs> Go ahead, Ashley. Um, I was going to say, you know, I think there are a number of things that are different about this. I, I think the, the thing that folks jump to pretty quickly is that we're in a state of international pandemic, which means that people are paying a lot of attention to media. People um, have some extra free time on their hands. Folks are maybe not traveling. Um, for some folks who I've talked to, they have children who are home from college who are talking with them about things that they're learning, which I think is huge. Um, but one of the things that I haven't heard us talk enough about is the importance of having time in between some of the first waves of the movement for Black Lives ago and now, and the, and the intentional steps that folks have been making to educate themselves, to pay attention to policies and practices in their organizations, in their neighborhoods, um, to have these kinds of conversations amongst friends, and to really build up some of the courage which is required, that, that um, is required to courageous in some of this. So I think it's a number of things, but um, I really would say that those are some of the most prevalent things as I've experienced them. Melissa, I think you were going to add something there. So please Yeah, I actually please. think that Ashley kind of hit the nail on the head for me too. I think it's something about the fact that we're all forced to pause and literally sit still in this moment that is allowing for a different type of attention to be paid at this moment. And so I kind of echo all of Ashley's comments for sure. Um, this is Isioma. I'd add that um, in addition to the pandemic, um, within that we saw demographics that were disproportionately impacted. So you see the manifestation of inequity in our healthcare system. You see um, communities that have lost their jobs. 
and again, people sat in that and it manifested in this sort of emotion. I mean, George Floyd was just the straw that broke the camel's back. But this is a culmination of years and re of relegation. And although um, this time is different, it is also much of the same. In 1963, Martin Luther King wrote um, his letter from a Birmingham jail. And he discussed how years and years and years of relegation sort of manifest itself into this. And so we're seeing a time that is very parallel to what we saw in 1963. And so as much as there's a testament to this outcry and this outrage and this public mobilization now, it also shows that we haven't come very far at all. And that's why the call to groups like this is that we have to do more and we have to remain steadfast in our actions. Greg, you're on mute. When we talk about remaining steadfast, um, I'd like people maybe to speak to how the youth have uh, energized what, what we're seeing and whether we believe the youth can sustain that effort. Um, you know, I was doing some research over the, over the weekend and thinking about uh, during the civil rights movement and how you know, it was strategic in its efforts, um, sustained protest at particular times. This is a little different. It's a sustained period of time um, now where I think we're in what, day 26? Um, can, you, can you talk about the, the role that young people are playing and whether you believe they'll be able to sustain that level of energy? Um, this is key. Hope everyone can hear me and, and, and uh, Greg, it's good to see you. Uh, great to see everybody who I can see on, on, the, on, on the screen here. Um, I would say something that I find surprising, uh, Greg, and not surprising, but I think was helpful. Uh, those of you who, uh, who are familiar with our, one of the greatest comedians of all time, Dave Chappelle, uh, in one of his recent um, pieces, he said, the streets are speaking. And I think, um, he hit the nail on the head with that. The streets are speaking. And I think those brothers and sisters representing all different races and creed um, who've been really impacted by um, not just COVID-19, but just the many historical issues we've dealt with in this country, that um, they're speaking now. But I think it also then takes, just like with the civil rights movement, I'm glad my sister mentioned that earlier, it takes some people behind the scenes, it takes strategy, it takes people to take the momentum that we have now and carry it forward into something that is meaningful, whether it's, and I wouldn't necessarily stop just at a police um, reform, but meaningful change within our institutions. Um, with all the health and wealth gaps that we see, um, we need some brothers and sisters and people who are interested in actually the policy and strategy. So the streets are speaking now, and I encourage our young folks and those who are part of that to continue to keep speaking, but we know that can't sustain a movement you actually need to now put pen to paper and make some things happen, um, get our elected officials, help hold our elected officials accountable and really make some change in, in, in the ballot box when that time comes. Yeah, and to add some, some levity to that, um, I'm only 38, but I get tired quick <laughs> and I don't have energy. So I'm thankful for the teenagers and the young adults in my midst, because I'm like, y'all go ahead on. Just go ahead, I'll be right here. I'll pick you up, drop you off, provide you something to eat. But I do think it's a balance of all that gracious and beautiful energy that the youth bring to the table and then groups such as this that need to organize itself to do something productive. Because what I do not want in this moment is the time to be wasted. So I came prepared with like five pages of notes. And then when Jeff was talking, I took another um, two pages of notes. But one of the things that Jeff ended with was Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And for me, I have a master's in both community psychology, which tastes and feels very much like public health, but also have an MBA. And so it is this unique sort of difference in opinion when you think about business versus people. And a lot of times, they seem to be mutually exclusive, but they don't have to be. And I think that as a, a business group, we have to fully appreciate that there is no differentiation between how the people feel and how the corporation succeeds. And so I think it's extremely important that the business case has got to be made for the people um, with specific mov movements, whether it's black, yellow, orange, red, gold, but 
it's a collective thing that truly, truly um, matters at the end of the day because we can't look and say that that's their problem because effectively their problem is our problem because right now it's sitting at our front door. Yeah, I agree with that, Melissa. And one of the things I would add, so public allies serves pr like predominantly folks 18 to 25. So we work a lot with youth. And I'm also on the board for Leaders Igniting Transformation, which Leanna spoke about um, in the call a couple of weeks ago. And one thing that I would say is, uh, it's certainly true that young people are leading this. Young people have always, like all movements, been at the forefront. I think there's something about their energy that's, that's just like boundless. Um, but they're also being strategic. So I don't think it's an either or. So yes, sure. I would 100% agree that they're leading in the streets and that they need us to also lead in other spaces, but they're also leading in other spaces. So when I think about, you know, last Thursday night, the Milwaukee Board of School Directors did to remove policing, determine the policing contract in MPS, which is huge. It's something that um, will change the experience of students all across our district. Amazing. But it wasn't something that started, you know, 26 days ago. Leaders Igniting Transformation has been organizing for that specific thing to happen for three years. So I think what we're seeing is young people take the lessons of our past. That is it Isioma? Am I saying that right? Isioma? I don't want to mispronounce your name. That's really important. Um, but, you know, when we think about like the lessons of the past that are so important to know, young people know that it's not just like in the streets, which is important. They know that it also takes place by having one on one conversations with board members or by getting to know elected officials and being the people who are asking to speak with them directly, not just asking for business leaders and companies like us to do that work. So it is interesting to me because I think that that makes this time very different. We're seeing young people get really wise about what it takes at all levels and they wanna be at the table. Like they really wanna be situated at the table and ask for things directly. I'll add in as well that I think that it's on us as the GMC as an organization um, for those of us who want to be better white allies that we have to be able to listen. So um, that's something for me that I've been really trying to practice and to create space because you don't want the youth or the people who've been doing this for however long to keep shouting into some kind of a void. So I'm certainly, I'm so happy to see some of these wins um, that are happening here locally and nationally because it does show that the change in the tide that's happening. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that this continues to be a platform that's open to continue to listen. So, you know, I, you talked about uh, the police issue. And so part of my question was around police brutality. So I'm gonna go off script just a little bit and maybe um, ask people to react to the concept of defunding the police. And do people believe that there's enough clarity around what defunding the police means, because that's one actionable issue that I've been hearing people talk about. Um, and I'd like to make sure that um, the perspectives of individuals who are, 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 are talking about it um, are able to get, get their perspectives out. I, I spoke with my son about what he thought it meant, and I talked to others, and I'm hearing different things. So give me your perspective around um, defunding the police. Um, obviously, it's in reaction to po police brutality, but I, I, I want to see if people are talking about the same thing. Yeah, well, um, I'll jump in here. Um, defunding the police has become a trigger word, and I see a, um, a meme circulating the internet that people are opposed to defunding the police, but it sort of puts perspective on it when you think that we've been defunding education for years. Defunding yeah. the police isn't so much as abolishing the police as it is appropriating those funds uh, into different areas of the community that will help build the infrastructure. When you think of uh, Los Angeles County, I think upwards of 54% of the county's budget goes to the police force, oftentimes paid out in salaries, pensions, and overtime. And so what we mean by defunding police isn't doing away with the police, because let's be realistic. We all want someone to pick up the phone when we dial 911 and when we're in a state of an emergency. But what we're doing is taking those funds and investing them in, in our school systems, our education, investing them in community infrastructure so, so that we can build systems into place that will help uplift, up, uplift our communities. And so defunding does not mean abolishing. Yeah, I, I, I completely um, agree with that. And I saw that same meme and that was one of my mm -hmm. many talking points that I prepped to share, but it, that, that's just the fact of it. And 
Um, this is not the best story to share, but I've had three relatives murdered with, by gun violence in Milwaukee, one in Atlanta, um, one just literally a week ago, um, just last week. Um, and then one three months ago. <laughs> and it just, just makes you wonder, like, It just makes you wonder, like, I mean, the system is just messed up. I prefer to use some curse words to really, like, express what I want to feel. But because we have to be politically correct in the GMC, I won't. But let me just say this. It, the reality of how America was created was not based on principles that respected everybody. And so we're in a position where we are working backwards, and we have been working backwards for a very long time. And so, um, I think I need like two minutes. I'll just pass the baton. Thank you, Melissa. To somebody else for a moment. I'll just be right, right back. Uh, Greg, I, I do want to share that uh, when, when you talk about, uh, when talk, people talk about defund the police, Neuroside Partners, we work closely with our police department and NPD, and I give it up to Captain Jeffrey Norman. It's a great you know, captain. But I would say, I think ultimately for many of us, and at least the way I feel, I live in Sherman Park. You probably heard the sirens uh, in the background. It's not working. So every time I hear the police say that if you defund the police, then the cause of the service is going to go up. Like, and violence is going to happen. And <laughs> um, one pet peeve of mine, reckless driving is a major issue. And so I went out to the police department and said, hey, can you get us some signs? And no one can get a sign. So then I took money from my own pocket and started buying signs to say, even if it doesn't help, at least we are, as a community, we're gonna to have to respond to the needs that are affecting us because apparently we're not getting the support and what we need from the things that bother us. So when I hear the defund the police, that that means taking five, 10, 15, 20, 30% and putting it towards something that as a community that we live in, that we can then have some control over and respond to and add value, maybe it's, mental health issues, addiction issues, I'd rather have control over that as opposed to police always saying they need more, but my problem isn't being solved when it comes to violence and crime in my neighborhood. And I would just like to add, um, you know, I, so I, I think it's really important that as we're having this conversation, we examine the history of policing and we examine why police function to protect property and people who have a lot of wealth, right? If we think about like creation of police in this country, that is true. And certainly there's like the desire to protect and serve. And I think, I mean, I grew up in Milwaukee. Keith, I also live in Sherman Park. I've lived here my whole life um, with the exception of time I spent living in Walnut Way. So like, um, you know, I remember when police would hand out baseball cards. You know, I remember when police were like very present and when we knew who our people were. And I think in that environment, it's different. It's easier to ask for help. You know who you're talking with. But right now that is not the case. And as we are on this call specifically with the DMC, I think this is a really critical conversation because this is a big conversation. We have to examine the role of policing with property protection and wealth because if there weren't the large inequities that existed in Milwaukee, we wouldn't have such a militarized police. And we're not talking about folks on bikes who are handing out bicycle car or uh, baseball cards. We're talking about folks who have, you know, we were talking about the tanks that appeared like overnight. We're talking about folks who have better shields than our medical professionals have when fighting a global pandemic. There are many, many things wrong with the, the level of um, resourcing that goes into policing people who have not a lot. And so I think as we examine this, we can't remove like how deep the inequities are. And so when we talk about defunding police, um, you know, I think it's really important to think, not just to say we should fund education instead, but we should fund education because that is a better solution to inequity than policing people who don't have anything on healthcare because that's a better solution than policing people who are who may commit crime because they feel like they need to pay medical bills that our healthcare system burdens them with. Right. So there are there are many things I think we have to examine in this conversation. So I, I want to thank all the panelists for you know being as, as candid and as direct um, and and open as possible. You know, I have one additional question, but what I'm going to do here is just to pivot and just ask people to think about it and you'll move into your breakout rooms. Uh, let's think about 
what the GMC should be doing in response. So we've heard uh, that you know young people are really driving um, and are a catalyst uh, at this time. Um, we've we've heard about one action uh, oriented issue relative to defunding the police. Uh, clearly, as leaders in this community, we have a responsibility to um, not only listen and, and and respond, but also to to lead. So um, I, I think the breakout sessions will help us to think about what the GMC uh, should be doing and what uh, your individual roles will be uh, as we go forward uh, in this um, incredibly uncertain time. But we know one thing, it's going to continue. Time will continue. So we have some responsibilities uh, to come up with uh, solutions. And in particular, I just want to thank Melissa for being so honest and and open, and I know it's not easy to share your your own feelings. So thank you for doing that. 